You're now listening to The Sound of Sanity. This sound will continue for the duration of the program. Hey folks, welcome to Sound of Sanity. I am Nathan, host. We've got the captain right there, Benjamin Solzer. Hello. It's Baster. We've got... Our greatest living theologian, Jake Where Menzel. Where did these new nicknames come from? <laughs> Nathan's id. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some kind of passive aggression there, but against uh-huh. who? Against what? Against why? Yeah. Who could tell? I haven't examined it myself. I just thought it was time. We've been doing this for a thousand years, and you know what? I actually do know exactly what it's about. I just realized it. It doesn't have anything to do with either of you. It's not anything I want to say on mic. For one thing, I did. I do have some friends that I get together and pray with in our church, and for some reason, we were talking about who the greatest living theologian was, and I said Jake, obviously, and they said, "Why don't you say that on the podcast?" And so I am now, <laughs> now saying it on the podcast. So All right, I gotcha, gotcha, <laughs> got him. Um, I can't think of a better one. Can you think of a better living theologian than? <laughs> Jacob Menzel. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> like who? He'd put himself up there. Uh, Tim uh, Keller just passed. Oh, Scott Swain at RTS Orlando. I've listened to some of his lectures on the sacraments. And they you were think really Swain helpful. beats Menzel? I mean, <laughs> not as a pastor or anything. He's a professor down there. Has Sway never been there for you when you needed a friend? He was there in the classroom when I visited RTS. Okay, well, I guess Jake wasn't <laughs> wasn't there, there for me then because I didn't even know him. I can't be responsible for who knows and doesn't know our greatest living theologian. <laughs> I mean, I've done my best to make sure the maximum amount of people know him. I'm in the Jake Mental business over here. I'm trying. I'm holding up my end. But if you don't know Jake, then you don't know the world's... Greatest living theologian. Yes, you do. Apparently, you did get an old Swat, Scott Swan. More like Swain. S- more like Rot <laughs> Swain. <laughs> That's right. Now, Jake Mensel, he's, our, he's the greatest theologian that I personally know. Well, I suppose there's a few. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we'll brook no argument. Uh, for, on this podcast, Jake Mensel, the world's greatest living theologian. And Ben, the captain of all that he surveys. surveys. Yes. Wow. All right. You never see catch Ben swabbing the deck. I've not seen Ben swab a single deck. He don't swab no decks because he's the captain. He's like, you there, boy, swab this deck. (laughs) I've heard Ben say that (laughs) once. I've heard him say it a thousand times. One day they'll respect me, Nathan. They do, Ben. One day. They'll swap the deck. They I fear the floggings? Through. As they should. As they should. I mean, <laughs> it's a flogging. What are you going to do? Be happy about it? No. No, no, no. Ah, naval discipline. People romanticize it. I think it was a little harsh. <laughs> 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 but you can read your master and commander. It is great. Nothing rhymes with harsh. <laughs> Marsh. Marsh. Yeah, sorry. I like to shop at Marsh. I don't like to shop at Marsh. Marsh sucks. I don't even know if Marsh is still a thing. <laughs> Certainly not in this town. All right, fellas. We are discussing the things that have happened in culture in the month of uh, May. Yeah, It's 1984 world. Unfortunately, we only have one article in our feed. Now, if you'd like to fill that feed up, you can go to patreon.com forward slash sound of sanity. You can sign up. You will have personal access to the captain, to the greatest living theologian, to the host. You'll be able to even dictate what they do. We didn't get a little lot of dictation today. We just got this one article on posted by one Jake Menzel on an AI controlled drone goes rogue. Ah, uh, yes. Kills human operator in USAF simulation. It was dystopian feeling. That's why I put it in the dystopian channel. <laughs> the dots are all being connected right now. Jake, thanks. Yes, straight out of a uh, science fiction novel. What else is there to say about that? The headline's a little bit misleading because no one yes. actually died. That's right. It was a simulation. 
And it does say in simulated test, but it makes it sound like they were doing a simulated test. Right, and then he actually killed the, the drone actually killed the person. Like in RoboCop when they're testing out the robot and then it shoots the guy yeah, for yeah. a really long time. It sounds like that. It's a very clickbait. It's very clickbait. Slash fake news-ish kind of a title. The simulated person died. It's like the Kobayashi Maru or something. Mm -hmm. I'm explaining these to people. And once, once you say RoboCop and Kobayashi Maru, everyone that you're talking to understands exactly what you're talking about. That's been my experience. So... Yeah, it's like in the simulated test, in the simulation, the simulation killed the guy. And the thing that we're supposed to be scared of is that the simulation will obey its order at the cost of human life. Like it's supposed to accomplish mm -hmm. this objective, but the human pilot is like not doing the objective. And so the human pilot's like, I am a human. I understand how to do things even better. And the simulation's like, no, I will kill you. So it's kind of like Hal 1000 in our the Jake's favorite movie. There you go. The yep. 2001 A Space Odyssey. I don't think there's a movie I enjoy more. No, I don't think there was. Yeah. These days, there's nothing I look forward to more than anything that will help me fall asleep. <laughs> and I can't think of a movie that is more of a snooze fest. I put 2001 A Space Odyssey at the top of the list for greatest all-time movies. Let's examine the word snooze fest. It's like a festival of snooze. Indeed. Two things <laughs> you would not expect to go together. <laughs> like we're but throwing somebody, a snooze fest, man. <laughs> somebody put them together in order to indicate something that would put everybody in the room. Right. A whole party, a whole festival to sleep. And that's what that movie is good for. And so when you picture a festival of snoozes, don't you picture like da, 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 what I picture is a really awesome <laughs> happening party. And then somebody puts on 2001 like a Space Mariachi Odyssey snooze fest. <laughs> and, and within five minutes, people are just sprawled out, sleeping and snoring. I imagine like, hey, welcome to I don't know why it's a Spanish party in my mind, but it's obviously a fiesta, a fiesta. Yeah. Like, welcome to the snooze fest, man. We got snoozes everywhere. And we got guacamole over there. And Get yourself a snooze, man. And then you get a snooze. And folks, we need more material to talk about on this podcast. Wow. Yeah, we do. This podcast will be a snooze fest. Well, a metatextual snooze fest. Where well, we talk about the truth is, in our Discord, which I've been looking over, has really just been the only discussion that... I that I see are people talking about our latest episode. Yes, indeed. People are pretty scandalized by that show that rips us off. Yes, they are. Well, I'm glad that people love us and want to defend our honor. Yeah. But, but yeah, man, guys, we got to talk about something. You, you want you want to revert to not revert, but you want to bridge into a sanity shelves thing. I'll talk about one more book I'm reading. Sure. Yeah. Hey. I feel like we're devolving. It's like we're going from a spaceship into a monkey. Okay. A monkey who reads books. A monkey who reads books. Right. Yes. Right. Hilarious. Okay. It's pretty funny. If you think about it. <laughs> All right. We're going to talk about a book that it's a Ben's monkey. been reading. What is this book you've been reading, Ben? Oh, I've been reading Defense of the Faith by Cornelius Van Til. And if you listener know who that is that might make you a nerd but it's apologetics it's, you might be a, <laughs> a reformed nerd. you might be a reformed nerd it is a book of apologetics and it is like all of van till who was a dutch guy who taught at westminster seminary in philadelphia as one of the founding faculty well, no hold on yeah i think i'm right i'm getting my timeline confused as one of the founding faculty he's been a lot of his life in America. His writing is not the easiest to follow a lot of the time for whatever reason. I mean, he's writing, he's very philosophical. He's quite philosophical. He's quite abstract. Nevertheless, I have found him over the past several years to be someone who's very helpful to me, even on a devotional level. Why is that? It's because he loves God, loves God's word. I think you can feel that even if you're talking about abstract stuff, because he is always rubbing, shoving your nose in. You're, the whole basis for knowledge and truth is what God's revelation. That's what it is. There's no other... In fact, that's my argument, unbeliever. This is what Van Til would say. It's my argument. Um, there's no better explanation 
for everything. In fact, there's no other coherent explanation. Other religions can't give one to you. Secular philosophy can't give one to you. The Bible alone gives you a foundation for knowledge and truth and right and wrong. And this is a good book. I, it's not something I just recommend to everyone because it is dense and it can be frustrating. But there's a lot of pearls in there. So here's one thing specifically that he helped me with. He talked a little bit about Paul going to Athens to address the philosophical crowd who were always discussing ideas. It's in Acts chapter 17. And Paul goes and addresses everyone. And Van Til puts it, he puts what Paul is doing in terms of his own discussion of his own like philosophical flavored discussion of God's revelation versus pagan man's just trying to do everything autonomously without reference to God. We can know the world. And whatever he did, I couldn't quote anything. It's something snapped into focus, which I really appreciated. And that was that when Paul goes and talks about, he goes after the unknown God. Van Til's point was the unknown God is an admission that in fact, the Athenians know nothing about truth or religion. They actually, they, they actually have, just by admitting the idea of the unknown God, they, they lost the whole ball game. And the way that works is, hey, Athenian, do you know if this unknown God wanted a statue? No. Do you know if the unknown God is less powerful than the current deities that you, you know, like Zeus, whoever, that you know about, or more? We don't know that. Do you know if the unknown God accepts the worship of other deities? Let's say the unknown God is more powerful, and he's ticked off that you're worshiping Zeus. Do you even know that? No. Well, if you don't know that, what do you know? Essentially, nothing, which I think is very helpful. You don't know anything. The unknown God is an admission that you're completely without a foundation for your whole religious life of your whole society. And that's the kind of thing Van Til is trying to do, is trying to shift your framework towards. There's if as soon as you admit in on a pagan perspective that you you just don't know about the other gods that might be out there you're admitting your whole system of worship you're calling your whole system of worship into question on such a complete level that it's completely untrustworthy can't trust it stop go no further you just admitted total ignorance if there's an unknown god <laughs> who may be greater than all the gods that you have idols of you you have no idea what you're doing and so Anyway, I'm a big fan of that kind of thing. I find it really helpful. And that's being until for you. That's his strategy. It's kind of part of his evangelism, too, because he'd like to evangelize. He actually liked to talk to unbelievers. And uh, he has a funny little tract that I think Nathan has read. It's, I think the word would be quaint. I would use the word quaint. It's like a little gospel tract to an unbeliever where right. he tones down some of his philosophical language. But you can still tell that he's abstract and that I, f I feel like I, I can tell that he's Dutch. And he's just, <laughs> he, he just has all of these funny things like, ah, I'm here for tea, my friend. And let's, <laughs> let me ask this question. But I see you don't like that question. Maybe we should finish our it's tea later. Dorky. It's <laughs> very funny. But as he goes, his, he's still trying to do what he always does, which is flip things so that the unbeliever can see that he lives in essential ignorance and that in trying to separate himself from God and say, I can know the truth apart from anything God reveals. That's my right. That's my dignity. Like, I'm a modern man. I have an idea of reason and truth that stands by itself, and I don't need your God. Van Til's point is, you are standing on nothing, literally nothing. And you're even, you even admit it as you go, but you don't even realize that you admitted it as you went. And I'm trying to make you see that you already admitted it, that you already lost, that there's nothing else to stand on except what the God of the Bible gives you. So I hope that made sense. And if that appeals to you, Maybe there are books downstream of Van Til that I would recommend. Maybe someone like John Frame or something who boils this stuff down. I feel like there's another author I looked at recently who is probably going to be an easier starting point than Van Til himself, who I have a lot of affection for. There you go. I was in a car outside Connie and Laurel's house in Lafayette a good, oh, 14 years ago. And I was like, I don't know how I know anything. And I worked out a Vantillian epistemology for myself. Only I did not realize I had done that until a decade or more later when I read some Vantill. And I was like, oh, this guy's arrived at the same conclusions that I did. <laughs> and I thought it was, it did Vantill credit. 
that, <laughs> I, I think so too. I think if it's something an ordinary Christian can get to by himself, that makes it even better. It's not just some dumb theory thought up by a scholar in an ivory tower. Yep. It's just like, how do you know anything? Well, if you're going to ask those kinds of questions, you should arrive where the Bible sets you down. That's all Van Til wanted to do for all of his frustrating difficulty in and for all the frustrating difficulty there can be in reading him. Pretty good for some fruity Dutch man. <laughs> Jake, your thoughts? I approve. Jake approves of Van Til. Well, yes. And therefore he has the approval of... What the world's greatest living, living theologians. This is like a coup for Van Til. A coup for Van Til. <laughs> I mean, Van Til's passed on now. But, uh, hey, it's a coup for his heirs. Yeah, They'll be seeing a bump in sales. Yeah. You know how Van Til's heirs are about their green scratch. Oh, man. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yes. If you've ever gone to the mansion of Van Til's heirs, then. The mansion of Van Til's heirs. <laughs> I think we have our episode title. <laughs> <laughs> I think we do. Ah, friend, I would offer you some tea, but that's the kind of thing they say to you. All right, mm, folks. That's right. This has been another great episode of Sound of Sanity. Jake, any final thoughts? No. Ben, any final thoughts? Nope.